I'm Willie Marshall, and this is a program about black leadership. When immigrants came to American shores to find a new home, they came freely. The black man from Africa was forced to come in chains. For over a century now, he has been a citizen. Yet, in many ways, he is still homeless still spiritually adrift between a noble dream and his racial motherland. W.E.B. Du Bois said it best, one ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two warring ideals in one dark body. The history of the American Negro is the history of this strife, this longing to attain self-conscious manhood, to merge his double self into a better and truer self. In this merging, he wishes neither of the other two selves to be lost. The beginning of this history was written on the back of slave Gordon and two centuries of handles. Gordon and Emily and Martha were eventually freed, but not without a civil war. Over their color, their slave labor, and the kind of country this would be. The civil war may have saved the Union, but the American black was left still feeling black without feeling American. A divided person demanding that he be allowed to feel both black and American. We're still working at it. But three early leaders gave us a start in trying to reach that sense of oneness. Booker T. Washington, a practical, patient man. W.E.B. Du Bois, a searching intellectual. And Marcus Garvey a Jamaican visionary. Booker T. Washington, born on the dirt floor of a slave cabin in Hales Fort, Virginia, was nine years old when the Civil War ended. Sixteen years later, on Independence Day, July 4, 1881, he stood in a shanty on the grounds of the African Methodist Episcopal Church in Tuskegee, Alabama, and opened a school that would prove to be a guide to racial progress for Afro-Americans during the next 40 years. And the brick would be its symbol. The brick, because it was simple, solid, and you could build things with it, one step at a time. It was the simple things Washington later remembered that marked his way to Tuskegee. All stamped with numerals that he memorized, then practiced in the dust with his fingers. The young black whom he saw in a public square reading a newspaper aloud to people unable to read for themselves. Viola Ruffner wife of a Union general whose strict ideas about thrift and cleanliness became his creed when he worked for her as a servant. And the dark West Virginia coal mines where he first heard of a school 500 miles away that could teach blacks how to make a thing as well as any white man. Washington went to Hampton Institute, a vocational school in Virginia, whose strong and disciplined director, Samuel Chapman Armstrong, trained young blacks in manual skills while commending them to the moral, educational, and practical value of self-help and hard work. Young as he was, life in the South had taught Washington that if a man had land, he had the means to power and respect. If, Washington reasoned, a black man had the skills to make money, he too would have the means. When he graduated and stepped into that first rundown Tuskegee classroom, Hampton was his model for that vision of the future. But for now, bricks and self-help, literally from the ground up. Tuskegee students dug raw clay from the Alabama soil, fired it themselves in the campus brickyard, and turned it into school buildings where they learned useful trades. And in an atmosphere of non-denominational religious observance, disciplined study, and rigorous work, young blacks learned the virtues of self-help, personal grooming, and Christian morality. 
Such ideals were dear to 19th century America and offered no threat to white society. What was seen as a threat, however, especially in the South after the Civil War, was the sight of ex-slaves walking around in freedom and dropping votes into ballot boxes. Even before Tuskegee opened its doors, both sides of the Mason-Dixon line were using legal maneuvers, outright fraud and violence to keep the black poor, isolated from white life and politically weak. Mindful of this climate and convinced that Tuskegee would fail without white goodwill and northern industrial money, Washington seemed to turn a deaf ear and a blind eye to racial injustice and focused instead on the economic promise of his way rather than the civil or social rights of blacks. In a five-minute speech given before a biracial audience at the opening of the 1895 Atlanta Exposition, he condensed his view of race relations in a striking image. In all things that are purely social, we can be as separate as the fingers, yet as one as the hand in all things essential to mutual progress. The speech brought him instant fame. To white America, the Negro he seemed to be speaking for was the Negro it had been waiting for. Segregationists breathed easier. Industrialists with an eye on cheap labor flocked to give him support. And as he mixed with mighty tycoons like Andrew Carnegie and Robert Ogden, and even dined at the White House, the ex-slave from Hales Ford struck most blacks as the man who might indeed lead them to the promised land. But not all blacks. Dictator, Pope Washington, the great divider, were only a few of the names thrown Washington's way by those who felt Washington was selling black political rights down the river. Boston was their main stronghold, and William Monroe Trotter, editor of the Boston Guardian, their most militant watchdog. Outraged by Washington's tolerance of lynchings, he stood on a chair in a Boston church and shouted Washington down with the cry, are the rope and the torch the only thing the race is to get under your leadership? His arrest for provoking the riot that followed brought a new leader to the surface. Up till then, W.E.B. Du Bois had been of two minds about Washington, but Trotter's militance, purity of motives, and jailing finally pushed Du Bois off the fence. Born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, to one of its oldest families, as a youngster he suffered little of the extreme poverty and rabid discrimination that blacks in the South took for granted. Later, while attending Tennessee's Fisk University in the 1880s, he experienced these conditions firsthand during the summers, he taught children in the log huts that passed for rural schools and was shocked at what he saw. I saw the race problem at nearly its lowest terms. Convinced that the lowest term became the stereotype that whites applied to all blacks, Du Bois was determined to prove it false. Armed with a PhD from Harvard, he began the first of many social studies to document the variety of black social classes. Block by block, he conducted a survey of Philadelphia's 7th Ward. He found the variety he was looking for, but he also found that the upper classes were more concerned with keeping themselves apart from the lower classes rather than leading them. He left the streets of Philadelphia more certain than ever that by merely training blacks to be a permanent underclass of skilled laborers, Washington was surrendering black leadership to whites by default. Black hopes were being led down a blind alley. Was there a nation on God's fair earth civilized from the bottom upward? He thundered. Never. It is, ever was, and ever will be from the top downward that culture filters. And at the top, those whom Du Bois called the talented tenth, the college-bred intellectual and cultural elite of any race, whose true role lay in civilizing its people, a people who needed to know that there was more to life than hoeing cotton and making shoes. With an increased sense of urgency, he turned to men like these in 1905. They met near Niagara Falls with demands on their minds. Du Bois himself had reached a crossroads. Social studies were not enough. 
He and the others were fed up with a black leader who was the sole gatekeeper to white money and black jobs, strangled all opposition, and merely shuffled along the road to black political rights. The time for full equality was now, not later, and Washington had to go. As it happened, it was the Niagara movement that went, thanks to chronic cash problems, arguments between Trotter and Du Bois, Washington's opposition, and a style too far removed from the ordinary black. But it died pioneering a model of public protest on a national scale for the political struggle that lay ahead. Violence soon fathered a more lasting group. In Springfield, Illinois, troops and onlookers surveyed the results of a riot that broke out on August 14, 1908. Two days of white mobs raging through the city's black district ended with two blacks hanged from a dead tree, four whites murdered, and 2,000 blacks looking for shelter elsewhere. This was a riot in the very city where Lincoln lay buried. White liberals were shocked, and the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People was born. The NAACP picked up the banner of direct public protest and marched on with the avowed aim of equal rights and total integration. But Du Bois, director of research and the only black man at the top, as often as not found himself marching to the beat of his own drum, sometimes in the direction of racial identity, at other times toward achieving a sense of American unity. This, the association's magazine, and the brainchild of Du Bois, its editor, would record the tensions that these two ideals exerted on him in particular and black Americans in general. When America entered World War I, for example, black soldiers needed black officers. To prove that blacks could lead, Du Bois pushed for an all-black officer training school and was promptly accused by many blacks of denying the very integration he was supposed to be fighting for. The attack pressed a nerve that ran directly to the divided feelings of blacks split over how to be both black and American at the same time. Summing up the dilemma and the name-calling it provoked, he lashed out at his critics. If we organize separately for anything, Jim Crow. If we organize with white people, traitors. If unable to get the whole loaf, we seize half to ward off starvation, Compromise. If we let the half loaf go and starve, why don't you do something? Where in heaven's name, he cried, do we Negroes stand? At any given time, Du Bois himself stood where he thought he and the race could best handle the dilemma. In the training school incident, he had stressed separateness and black identity. A year later, with America in a world conflict, he asked blacks to forget their grievances and close ranks with whites in the fight for democracy. The radicals, especially Trotter, were not so overcome with feelings of patriotism or so forgiving and caustically observed that they would just as soon remember their grievances and fight for democracy in Georgia. When the war ended, the Paris Peace Conference divided the spoils. Du Bois, sent by the association as an observer, went to Versailles with Africa on his mind. Nations on both sides of the table had governed colonies in the dark continent for over a century. And with the old order breaking up, blacks worldwide seized the moment to lobby the conference for an Africa free of colonial rule. Nothing came of it, but Du Bois renewed his own interest in the belief that all people of African descent should unite for their freedom. He revived the Pan-African movement and promoted it in the crisis. He was not telling American blacks to return to Africa, but association leaders drew back. They wanted freedom for the colonies, but feared that the separatist and nationalistic caste of Pan-Africanism would undermine black integration into American life. Pan-Africanism never really got off the ground in America. Among other reasons, most Afro-Americans saw themselves as more American than African, and the black public in general confused it with a different crusade for racial pride mounted by Marcus Garvey. That blacks paradoxically shied away from Pan-Africanism while following Garvey was both a sign of the times and a tribute to the gifts of a remarkable man. 
He was not an American, but a Jamaican of pure-blooded African descent, as different from Washington and Du Bois in temperament and style as they were from each other. Seventeen years old and a journeyman printer, Garvey left the peace of his village at St. Anne's Bay for the excitement of the British colony's capital, a port city with a lively mix of English aristocrats, middle-class mulattoes, and black purebloods like Garvey. Kingston, Jamaica was a natural breeding ground for political harangues and street corner debates. They fascinated the boy and became his training ground for a style of oratory that would one day capture millions. Black working conditions thrust him in the direction of local reform. But when he sailed from Kingston in 1912 at 23 to raise money elsewhere for Jamaican reform, he hardly suspected that he was starting a restless and often bitter journey to fight for blacks thousands of miles away. From South American banana plantations to the half-finished Panama Canal, he found the same story. Dark people exploited and degraded. And every effort he made to retrieve their dignity by print or pleading was turned aside. London at the time offered an observer a racial cross-section of its empire that stretched from Africa to the Far East. There, between 1912 and 1914, Garvey came across a dream that suited the scale of his temperament and a book that inspired him to make the dream come true. Thousands of Africans lived in the city working for colonial freedom. Garvey met many of them and absorbed their passionate feelings about African nationalism. With this broader frame of reference, Garvey happened to read Booker T. Washington's autobiography, Up From Slavery. For the first time, the true humiliation and need of a great race spread all over the globe, yet ruled by white foreigners, struck the young Jamaican. Where is the black man's government, he asked himself. Where is his king and his kingdom? Where is his president, his country, and his ambassadors, his army, his navy, his men of affairs? Then and there he vowed, I will help to make them. Back again in Jamaica, and afire with a sense of mission, he founded a Jamaican version of Tuskegee, Universal Negro Improvement Association, or UNIA. But it didn't catch on. With Washington's example of self-help and his access to money in mind, Garvey turned to America. But by March 1916, when Garvey's boat docked in New York, Booker T. Washington had been dead for four months. No matter, Garvey, clearly knowing why he had come, carried a message that Afro-Americans would soon be ready for. Europe was deep in World War I. When America joined the fight a year later, black men entered the armed forces and left for France. This was a world conflict and the perfect opportunity for making a dramatic claim to equal rights. The Texas Grand Master of the Negro Masons declared, we believe that our second emancipation will be the outcome of this war. What they got instead were segregated regiments, talented men wasted in labor battalions, warnings against mixing with the French people, and reminders that they shouldn't expect at home the freedom they had grown used to abroad. When they did come home, Fifth Avenue welcomed them, and Harlem celebrated. but white Americans in general met them not with gratitude, but with fear. Meanwhile, the stigma of race was dealing black faith in vocational training a serious blow. Southern blacks who had moved north for industrial jobs found themselves the first to be fired when peace came. In this disillusioned and volatile climate, Garvey's message about black unity electrified the masses, and for several years, Harlem rang with his countless appeals for racial pride. Operating from this center of black life in America, Garvey took the Tuskegee doctrine of self-help, urbanized it, linked it with ideals of racial pride and black independence, even of nationhood, and sold it to the masses. By 1920, thousands had come under the spell of his personality, oratory, and vision. As a first step to his dream of a self-contained, independent black world of producers and consumers to put money into black pockets instead of white pockets, he set up the Negro Factories Corporation 
to give loans and technical help to small business. His most imaginative economic venture was the Black Star Line. Highly symbolic, it promised Afro-Americans a fleet of black-owned ships sailing the globe, not to carry blacks back to Africa, but to make the racial and spiritual link among blacks throughout the world visible for all to see and to think about. The ships Garvey managed to get afloat worked as a potent symbol of black pride and racial unity until the whole enterprise sank under the weight of leaky boilers, defective parts, and disputed stock operations that would finally contribute to his downfall. Meanwhile, making the most of symbols, he draped himself and his movement in the trappings of nationhood, complete with a national flag and anthem, as all kinds of UNIA auxiliary units and Garvey himself paraded through the streets of Harlem. To the masses, all this was heady. To a man like Du Bois, it was theatrical nonsense. Yet he could not but admire Garvey's common touch and breadth of vision. Ignoring the pageantry, Du Bois hoped for Garvey's cooperation. While he believed in working with whites, and Garvey did not, Du Bois felt that the Garvey movement dovetailed with his own recent work for racial pride, namely Pan-Africanism and his support of a distinctly black artistic culture then emerging in Harlem. Garvey scorned Du Bois's Pan-Africanism and attacked him personally as an elitist, more white man than black. Their growing differences became unbridgeable in 1922 because of an incident that led Du Bois to call Garvey either a lunatic or a traitor. It grew out of the only passions that Garvey shared with the KKK, segregation and racial purity. Garvey met with the head of the Klan in Atlanta to measure Klan strength and its sympathy with Garvey's own ideas. The meeting was a tactical blunder, raised a storm among blacks and cost Garvey many followers. Meanwhile, Black Star finances had come under scrutiny and blacks, including Du Bois, wanted answers. A formal investigation led to Garvey's arrest along with three other company officers. In 1922, all were indicted and in 1923, tried for mail fraud in the promotion and sale of stock. Garvey alone was found guilty. Judicial appeals failed and in 1925, he entered the Atlanta penitentiary to begin sentence. In 1927, President Coolidge commuted Garvey's sentence and deported him to Jamaica. Garvey's movement never revived. When he died in London in 1940, the UNIA was little more than a name. These early leaders tried to give their people three things that slavery had deprived them of. Economic independence, self-esteem as a race, and some control over their daily lives. Different as they were as leaders, if they struggled with each other, they struggled not over these goals, but how to reach them. In Washington's case, he looked at his people whom slavery had turned into field hands, took the measure of Southern white power, and calculated the odds. Given the time, he was probably right in choosing the half a loaf of economic progress. But his compromise should not have included silence in the face of lynchings and the spread of Jim Crow, nor the suffocation of all black dissent through spying, intimidation, and bribery of the black press. He did finance court cases to challenge segregation, but as secretly as he could. And given his influence, he should have fought harder for black political rights. Still, he was the first to put something besides a hoe in the hands of a southern black, and because of it, the beginnings of racial pride in his heart, though with the warning that he'd keep it hidden. In a sense, Washington put a white mask on the black man's face and told white people, see, we're like you. Garvey, inspired by at least the beginning, and without denying his debt to Washington, ripped off the mask and shouted, Look, we're black, black, and we're proud of it. With that, he launched the first successful black mask movement in the history of America. 
Garvey saw race as an international, not as an American problem. His real goal was not to empty America of its blacks, but to found a black nation in Africa similar to the present Israeli homeland for Jews, with enough economic and political power to influence racial conditions in this country. In this he failed, but until his downfall, engineered, some suspect, by an American government fearful of his power, he inspired black Americans to a lasting pride that became the cornerstone of the black power movements in the 1960s. The activism for black civil rights in those years was fed by the tradition of racial protest pioneered by Du Bois and the Niagara movement. If Du Bois did not command a following or leave behind phrases like Tuskegee or Garveyism to know him by, it is because labels could never contain the complexity of his search for a solution. Constant and unrelenting, that search led him to Marxism and self-imposed exile in Ghana, where he died in 1963, still fighting at nearly 100. For the complete liberation of all blacks, both in America and in Africa, at that very moment across the Atlantic, half a million Americans gathered around the Lincoln Memorial in a great civil rights march on Washington. Black pride, vocational training, a higher education, and public dissent. In the end, the battle among these black leaders over these different paths to the same dream finally led here, where the descendants of ex-slaves now stood by the thousands, their lives forever transformed. Men and women, black and proud to be so, educated and skilled as any citizen, and joined by thousands of other Americans in an historic protest for total equality, an equality that must surely come.